Okay, good morning everyone. I'm really excited to be talking to you today about Ionic, and um, this is a talk that I previously delivered at Mobile Tea Boston, and I, um, I want to share it here uh, just so that those who were not able to attend Mobile Tea can benefit from some of the information about Ionic and Angular contained in these slides, and uh, hopefully some of you watching this will be tempted to give Ionic a spin for yourselves because I think you'll really enjoy the experience of developing with Ionic and you'll love just how fast you can really create uh, really delightful and engaging user experiences uh, with existing AngularJS knowledge and Ionic which plugs right in with that. So the name of this talk is Building Mobile Apps with Ionic, an introduction and I'm going to be talking about Ionic, which is the AngularJS powered HTML5 mobile app development framework from Drifty. This is going to be largely an introductory level talk in terms of Ionic, but I'll assume that you have at least some handle on front-end JavaScript development and at least light exposure to AngularJS. I realize that may not be everyone uh, some of us are more steeped in Objective-C, uh, or perhaps even more Java-focused, uh, but my hope is that anyone who's watching this talk who has at least just a basic handle on JavaScript and front-end development can at least glean something from this talk. So, here we go. For starters, who am I? I'm a senior software engineer at Cengage Learning, the educational content technology and services company for the higher education K-12 professional and library markets. I'm a full-stack JavaScript developer there, and I regularly work in both Express and Node on the back end and AngularJS on the front end. I am also the technical co-founder and general counsel for a startup called Union Connect. We are a 2014 Mass Challenge semifinalist and we deliver mobile organizing and mobilization solutions for labor unions. We're moving to featuring Ionic more in our technology stack, and that's initially how I became acquainted uh, with the framework. Previously, I developed in Sencha Touch for two years. Before that, I was primarily a Ruby on Rails developer, uh, and before that, in another professional walk of life, I was a practicing attorney, uh, but we won't really get into that at all in this presentation. Here's what we're going to do in the next 25 minutes. I'm going to provide some context for Ionic and where it fits in among HTML5 mobile app frameworks. I'm going to make the case for why Ionic is the best solution that we now have for HTML5 mobile app development. I'm going to go through how Ionic fits in with the rest of the technologies that you may already be using to develop HTML5 mobile apps. We'll explore some of the components that Ionic provides and then finally uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the the services particularly around touch gestures that Ionic allows you to hook into. So I'm going to start out by asking what's in a framework? Because there are a number of ways that one can develop HTML5 applications for mobile. Uh, but I think it's important to look at the frameworks and uh, to see kind of what they're saying about the role of JavaScript in HTML5. And to decide which framework is most useful for you based on the philosophical choices that the framework is making. So... Most of what I've seen can be divided into three camps in terms of HTML5 mobile app development frameworks. On one side, you have jQuery Mobile, which is essentially an extension of jQuery UI, and jQuery provides a lot of mobile-y components that work well with touch gestures, and they basically blend JavaScript and HTML. And so you're going to have, if you use jQuery Mobile, you're going to have to, do a lot of DOM manipulation. You'll have to be very specific about how you write your HTML in order to be sure that your applications work. And I would argue that 
this is actually a flaw in the approach because your HTML is going to be very picky and perhaps even overly complex for the wrong reasons. On the other side, you have Sencha Touch. Sencha Touch is essentially a blend of ext.js for mobile, and so it's a JavaScript-centric framework for application development. And the idea behind Sencha is that you code in JavaScript entirely, or almost entirely, and Sencha builds your HTML components out of your JavaScript code. I used to really like this approach because it treated HTML as merely a product of JavaScript that could be understood by the rendering engine, namely WebKit. But lately I've come to feel that it actually creates a level of inflexibility as you have to use JavaScript to do what HTML does best, which is specify how to lay out content on the page. In the middle you have Ionic. Now, Ionic is built on AngularJS, and so it takes the same approach as Angular. Specifically, you're going to be handling all of your data and business logic in JavaScript entirely. And all of your layouts are going to be handled in HTML entirely. And then you can rely on Angular's two-way data binding as the glue between those two sides of your application. So you don't have to worry about how your DOM is constructed, usually, in order to manipulate and present your data, and you don't have to worry about your data all that much when you're building your interface. So Ionic is really in the middle of jQuery Mobile and Sencha. jQuery Mobile is not enough JavaScript, Sencha is too much JavaScript, and Ionic is just right. So why Ionic? You know, it's ultimately a matter of preference, but I've really latched onto Angular, and I feel that the Angular approach has tremendous wisdom behind it. And really, for me, the entire time that I worked with Sencha, I, I found myself thinking, gosh, if, if only there was a way for me to use AngularJS in the mobile context effectively, I would do it. And in my conversations with others, I found that there were companies that were using AngularJS, particularly with Trigger.io, for some reason that was a combination I saw a lot of. But for me, the idea of having to do things like handle scrolling and having to make a bunch of native-looking UI components that work right across devices on my own, it was just too daunting. And so I was stuck using AngularJS for non-mobile client-side contexts and Sencha for mobile. And at the same time, there were a lot of people who I kept hearing who were criticizing HTML5 to build mobile applications categorically. I mean, people would just denigrate HTML5 solutions for mobile without really thinking about why they were dissatisfied with the applications that were built in HTML5. They kind of knew that what they had seen in HTML5 for mobile was poor app performance and, and shoddy UI and very limited uh, user interfaces and functionality, but it doesn't have to be this way. It's not just, do you want something that works well or do you want the convenience of HTML5 as a developer? It's my assertion that the problem that we've seen with HTML5 mobile apps is that until now, there hasn't been a really good framework for building these applications. Now, Ionic is built on a great framework, and that framework is AngularJS. At the same time, you have the industry standard web view, and that is Cordova or PhoneGap. It's baked right in. And the fact that it's included in the project may or may not be the biggest deal to you if you're used to packaging up your stuff into a Cordova web view manually uh, or using PhoneGap build even. But I think it's nice that Ionic recognizes the importance of Cordova and builds their entire framework on top of Cordova by default. This is also going to easily allow you to use Cordova plugins to get at the phone's hardware. In fact, it couldn't be easier to do this than with NG Cordova, a companion Angular service layer for Cordova plugins built by the folks at Drifty. And we'll talk a little bit more about this service layer later on. Of course, using HTML5, particularly in as liberating a fashion as you can with AngularJS, 
means that you're using the world's greatest content layout engine. Now, I know some people would probably argue with me they like to design native interfaces in Cocoa Touch, but to the extent that it's not a matter of opinion, HTML5 is really a great engine for layout. Finally, you get a host of slick user interface components built as Angular directives when you use Ionic, and I'll demo some of these later on. So here's the technology stack. At the base, you have Cordova or PhoneGap, and with Ionic, you can also layer in your favorite JavaScript development technologies like Jasmine or Mocha for, for TDD uh, with Chai and Sign-On, and you can use RequireJS if you uh, understand and appreciate the syntax and like what they're doing. Uh, now, Ionic uses Gulp, so Grunt fans may have a bit of an adjustment, but I can tell you that I'm a Grunt person, but I can appreciate what Gulp is trying to do, and I've enjoyed using Gulp with Ionic. It's actually pretty slick. Uh, so take the time, learn a little bit about, a little bit about Grunt, and you may actually be uh, very happy that you moved over to it. Next up, you have Angular which provides the foundation on which everything else in your application is built. Angular UI manages state, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Ionix directives are built with SAS, so if you want to modify them, it's easy to do using an extremely powerful CSS preprocessor. Then you have Ionix components, and finally NG Cordova sitting off to the side, which is again the Angular service layer for Cordova plugins. Okay, so when I gave this talk at Mobile T, I asked the question, who's using Angular? And about half of the audience raised their hand that they're using Angular. I then asked, who loves using Angular? And those same hands went up. AngularJS is an incredible platform, and it seems that most of the developers that I encounter really appreciate what Angular is trying to do, and they love it, and for those who have uh, some minor qualms with some aspects of Angular. Uh, overall, uh, they really appreciate Angular and they enjoy developing in Angular and they can really do things easily in Angular that they weren't able to do when jQuery carried the day. Now imagine that you can take everything that you're doing in Angular and easily move in a mobile direction. So the fact that you're using Angular means that you can use Angular's great templating engine. You can use providers, so services, factories. Uh, you can use controllers and directives to accomplish your goals. And if you're like me, and you've built desktop applications in Angular, and you're moving on to building out a mobile interface, this means great potential for code reuse. This is especially so if you've properly modularized your code. So imagine if you didn't have to rewrite any of your services that interact with your server, for example. Some of your templates may just need one set of directives swapped out for another. Some of your controllers may port right over or at least serve as the basis for developing new ones in your Ionic application. And regardless of what state your application is in, you have to admit that the potential for using the same framework in both desktop and mobile web contexts is a huge boon to productivity for many reasons. Now when I spoke at Mobile T, I also asked who is using UI Router. And just about everyone who's using Angular, it seemed, is using UI Router. It's the replacement router replaces uh, ng route, and for anyone who's not using UI Router to manage state and routing in Angular applications, I really highly would suggest checking it out. Because UI Router is going to allow you to do so many more things in Angular in a much simpler fashion than you could do with Angular's out-of-the-box router. And I, I think it will actually make you, as a developer, uh, a much happier person in your job. Anyway, Ionic comes with UI Router baked in. So this is how you're going to be managing state in Ionic. And it's really particularly well suited for Ionic because of nesting. And here's an example. So if you've used any of the great mobile apps available today, you've probably seen a few paradigms for navigation. And one of them, which is what's sketched out here, is the side menu. You've probably all seen this. You tap the little icon in the corner, 
and the interface slides over and it reveals a navigation menu underneath. First of all, Ionic provides this paradigm as an Angular directive, so this is super easy to build right out of the box. But what powers this is UI Router. So you really have two views, one nested inside the other. And I'll show you that. And so you have this view that shows the menu, and you have this nested view over on the side that keeps sliding in and out of the viewport. And for this example, we've called that child view menu content. And when you define them on your state provider in UI Router, you can use these views and specify which templates to display in each. So you can see that uh, we have the menu view and we have menu.work, which is what displays when you tap the work uh, list item and you go to the work state. And you can specify URLs to each, as we've done here. So you can actually deep link to different states using UI Router's UISREF directive on your components and you can specify templates to display in each level of nesting of your nested views associated with each state that you add to your state provider in UI Router. So let's talk about components in Ionic. This is where we get to where Ionic is actually providing brand new material. You get a ton of super slick user interface components packaged up in directives. Things like lists, sliders, toggles, headers, footer bars, tabs, buttons, modals. They're all there. They're all ready to use. You also get a slew of icons, which I won't demo them all here, but you can actually see some of them in the examples, including on this screen. There's a set of icons that fit the design ethos of iOS, a set that fits nicely with Android, and then there's this device agnostic set. And there's even a way to switch which icons are displayed based on the device that's using the application. Though, to be honest, I, I've been a little bit lazy here, and I've just used the device agnostic set, as it's actually really nice, and it looks great in my application. You're also going to get a lot of touch gestures that you can bind to as events, things like tapping, holding, swiping, dragging, uh, and Ionic uses Hammer.js behind the scenes, so you can define custom gestures to your liking, like pinches, zooms, twirls, triple taps, uh, really anything that you can think of, you can define with Hammer.js. So it's really nice. Don't forget this is just Angular. So if you don't see the components you want, you can define your own. And you do that just by building your own Angular directives, and providing your template, your scope, and any JavaScript associated with making that, uh, that template work the way that you expect in your application. Really simple to do, especially if you have any familiarity with using Angular directives not with Ionic, your knowledge is going to port right over. Accessing the device hardware, uh, and actually even the native software components, it's really easy to do with a companion NG Cordova library. We talked about this a little bit earlier. NG Cordova takes a lot of great plugins for Cordova and puts an Angular service layer on top. So while I won't read all of the plugins out loud here, I, you can look at the slide, I'll tell you that some of the ones that I've used personally that I've found really useful or compelling are the camera, contacts, the device orientation, geolocation, local notification, push notification, social sharing, and vibration. And there's really a lot of great stuff in this companion library, so definitely check it out. Now this library solves a few issues that actually exist with the Cordova plugin architecture uh, out of the box. First of all, there's a curational aspect to the library. So I've seen plugins that don't work right or that need some cajoling to get into shape. Uh, NG Cordova includes plugins that work right, and if they don't, you can bug the folks at Drifty because Ionic is supporting them. Another thing that I've noticed is that the plugins in Cordova are kind of hit or miss. Uh, the plugin architecture has changed over time and over the releases, and some of them work with the CLI and others don't. Some plugins claim to work with the CLI and still don't. 
And so this should solve a lot of disappointment that, it can, that can actually occur at the plugin installation stage. Lastly, some of these plugins, particularly the contrib plugins, have varying syntax and conventions out of the box. And NG Cordova is a nice attempt to try to bring disparate styles under a common roof syntactically. Okay, so now for the fun stuff. I had initially planned a live coding exercise when I presented this uh, to Mobile T, but I realized that I really had like five minutes to do live coding, and so I, I kind of put together a simulation of how you would get started uh, with Ionic, and I found that, that actually worked really well. So here we're going to skip the live coding, and we're just going to do the simulation, and I'll show you how to get set up, and then we'll examine some of the components from some pre-made stuff that I've done, and this will be much better under the time constraints, I promise. It's much more fascinating than watching a live coding exercise. Okay, so here we go. Um, installation is very simple. You're going to use npm to install Cordova and Ionic globally. It's just npm install hyphen g Cordova Ionic. Enter. Next, you're going to use the Ionic CLI to create a new project. And this is done with Ionic Start and the name of your new application, whatever you want to call it. And the final parameter on the command here is, we, we've used side menu, it's a starter template, and Ionic currently ships with three of these. The side menu is the same thing that we saw when we looked at the example with UI router. There's a tabs starter app, which is uh, just has tabs along the bottom and a nested view in the middle of the viewport for content. And then lastly, there is blank, which should be pretty self-explanatory. Finally, you will CD into your directory for your new application, and you'll run Ionic Serve. And this is going to fire up your app in the browser. And if you have the Live Reload plugin for your browser for Chrome, it's going to take advantage of that so that any changes that you make in your application will show up immediately in your browser. And you can also run a watch on your SAS as well. So that will trigger updates whenever you change your styles. This is what we get if we use side menu. This is what we get initially, just right out of the gate. And I'll just play around with this a little bit so that you can see kind of what it involves. And this should give you a sense of how powerful the framework can be. This is just the starter template, and it can legitimately be the basis of an application that will eventually end up in production. It doesn't do the whole job for you, but it actually does do a decent portion of it reasonably well. Here's something that I made for Union Connect and that came straight out of the starter template. And here I'm going to use it to show you how Ionic handles scrolling. So this is actually a pretty big deal. If you just rely on the native scrolling for your web view, you're going to get some really disappointing interactions. Uh, as soon as you let up on the touch, it's going to stop scrolling, it's not, it's not going to bounce when it hits the end, and, and this is a really nice, smooth scroller with easing and with bouncing. And you can get scrolling anywhere you'd like just by using the Ion Content Directive, and you may need to set the Has Bouncing Directive to true, but that's not hard to do. The same UI also shows off one of the most powerful directives in Ionic, and that's Lists. And so you can use lists in uh, Ionic just by saying ion list, and then you can define list items with ion item inside of your lists, and you can set up list items and dividers in very similar ways. As you can see here, the top one is a list item, and the bottom ion item is an item divider, and they're set up almost exactly the same way. And there's just a ton of flexibility here. You can have lists with icons, and you would just set item icon left or item icon right or both on the container. And then you would put in your icon with an I, class is icon, and then the name of your icon. You can use Ionics Ionicons uh, very easily there in your lists that way. Badges with span classes badge, uh, very easy to set that up as well. Notes, span classes item note. Buttons, button, class button, avatars for a small image, typically of a person, 
and thumbnails for somewhat larger images in lists, uh, item thumbnail left, item thumbnail right, very easy to set that up. Now, remember it's just Angular under the hood, so you'll probably make liberal use of ng-repeat in your lists to define dynamic content. Here's a quick example. Inside of my list controller, I have a set of items I define on the scope. For each one, I have an icon and I have a title. And in my template, I've just defined one list item with an ng-repeat directive and a few placeholders. And boom. Angular binds your data to your list. There's a dynamically generated list based on the data in my scope. One of the last things that I want to show you is navigation in Ionic. As I mentioned earlier, Ionic makes great use of UI Router to handle nested states. It also uses UI Router to handle history. So here's an example of something in our app for Union Connect with some uh, mock data in place to show a few documents. And watch what happens when I click Chapters, I get the back button, I click Article 1, I get the back button, I go back, it goes back to the table of contents, I hit back again, it goes back to the uh, various documents that are available. And that works automatically. It's going to handle multi-level navigation with a back button. And if you have a sim if you have the same user interface uh, that you can arrive at through multiple navigational paths, the back button will keep track of which one was used to arrive at where you are. And so if you hit back, you go back to the right place. And so this was previously a very challenging problem to solve. And it's provided with a back button right out of the box for Ionic. And you can turn it off or modify it if you don't want it or if you don't like the way that it works. But to be honest, you're going to want this for at least some amount of your user experience. So it's nice that it's easy to set up and to modify. The last thing I'll show you is touch gestures. So Ionic defines a lot of really great touch gestures that are available as events that you can listen for. And you can have an event handler on your scope and hook that up with a directive that's named after the type of a type of gesture that you're listening for. And so it's very easy to attach event listeners to directives on your DOM. The top here is a simple example. Uh, what I'm showing on the side is actually a more complicated example that shows off the power of this paradigm. It's the card swipe, uh, which Ionic has created and actually packaged as a separate GitHub repo. Uh, which you can get at that URL at the bottom of that slide. And that's it. So when I presented for Mobile T, I took questions at this stage of the game. I obviously can't do that here, uh, but feel free to reach out to me uh, at the URL provided alongside of this video and also provided at that tiny URL at the bottom of these slides. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you found this to be a useful presentation.